Hello, everyone. Just making sure, just checking if this is actually working. Oh, it is. Okay, excellent. Okay, great. Well, we're just a couple of minutes late. Technology, I know, I know, I know. Um, I think I'm just gonna start right away. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, welcome. Welcome to my NTS Art of Heart program presentation of Juan Juana Juanita. Um, I'm very, very excited, and I must confess that I do have a script in front of me. And that is simply because I want to keep this short, sweet, um, although I am pretty sure that I'm just going to be able to keep it sweet because it might not be that short. So I hope you have your snacks around, um, a drink. This looks like a fancy drink. It's just iced black coffee. So let's get this started. But before anything else, I want to share something with you. And, um, and I will be talking a little bit more about uh, who I am and where I come from and my arts practice. Um, but off the bat, you have to know that I, I am originally from Mexico. Um, I was born in Mexico City, grew up in uh, Toluca, Toluca, um, Estado de Mexico. For those of you Latinx friends that are watching tonight, um, and I um, moved to uh, Corner Brook, Newfoundland and Labrador five years ago, and I decided to stay. And um, I, I moved here to pursue a theater degree at um, uh, Memorial University of Newfoundland. And then after completing my studies, I decided to stay. Um, and while I have been here in this beautiful province, I have learned a lot about um, indigenous people and the significance of what they have done um, for the, um, the protection of the land. And me as an immigrant um, coming from a, a colonized country, um, it was quite an experience to learn about the indigenous people uh, also from my land, from, from Mexico. Um, so it just put that into perspective, the difference between, um, the difference in, in similarities between, um, the indigenous people in Mexico and in, in, in Newfoundland. Um, so that's why it is very important for me to acknowledge them. Uh, so tonight I would like to acknowledge the, uh, the island of Ugdahumguk. Uh, Newfoundland as the unceded traditional territory of the Biotuk and the Migumac. Also, I would like to acknowledge Labrador as the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Innu of Netasenen and the Inuit of Nunatusabut and the Inuit of Nunatukabut. I recognize that um, all first people uh, who were here before us and those who live with us now and the generations yet to come. And to me, it is important to acknowledge them and because it also, I love words. And of course, like I will get into the why I became a writer. Um, but I know that, that words have power, but actions are way more powerful. So I try to think of the things that I, as an individual, do to contribute to the, um, the um, to taking care of the land, the land that, that we are shared, the land that I have been welcomed to um, to live in. Um, so I, I try to reflect on on the things that I am doing as an individual artist, as a human being, as a person, um, but also how how am I contributing with the indigenous community around me, both in my arts practice, but also in my day to day life. Um, so I would like to encourage you tonight, um, although this is a free event, 
um, I would like to encourage you to make a donation to an arts program at First Light. And First Light is a non-for-profit non organization that serves um, the or urban, indigenous, and non-indigenous community alike by providing programs and services rooted in the revitalization, strengthening and celebration of indigenous cultures and languages in the spirit of trust, respect, and friendship. Um, th this organization is uh, based in St. John's, um, Newfoundland and Labrador, and I am going to put a little link in the, um, in the comments um, where you can um, donate. Um, if you do so, I would encourage you to, mm, to leave a note along with your donation just um, so that they know that you're providing this money uh, to allocate it to an arts program in this organization. Um, excellent. Well, thank you very much. And now I would like to talk a little bit about me. Who is this person that you're talking to tonight? Um, well, I am super excited, super, super excited, even though I am talking to my computer. Uh, it's not the very first time, so I'm kind of used to it. Um, but okay, so hello, everyone. My name is Santiago Guzman. My pronouns are he, him. I am the artistic director of Todos Productions, uh, which is an organization that seeks to promote, produce, and support the work of underrepresented artists in Newfoundland and Labrador. I am also the artistic associate for a Playwrights Atlantic Resource Center based off of Halifax, Nova Scotia. Um, it, uh, as, a, as an artist, I would uh, identify myself as an emerging playwright, performer, director, producer, ticker, ticket printer, theater parking assistant, you name it. Anything that is close or that would allow me to be close to a theater, I will do that. Um, as I said in my introduction, I am originally from Mexico, but now I'm based. Um, in St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador, and I am really, really happy to be where I am. So I started writing, and as I said earlier, I moved to, to Newfoundland and Labrador to pursue a, an acting degree. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be an actor. And I wanted to learn the longest monologues. I wanted to um, captivate my audience. Oh, that was my elbow. Um, captivate my audience. I wanted to look so pretty under those lights and costumes. However, the reality in my community was that there were not enough characters that justly represented the local arts community. I couldn't see myself nor any other diverse person represented on stage. Um, and some of these characters were constantly uh, uh, perpetuating stereotypes or um, perpetuating, sorry, geez, uh, perpetuating uh, the stereotypes and, or, or encouraging typecasting. So when I realized that, and I actually, in my, in my career, in my very short but mighty career, um, I have had uh, instances where people have said to me that I was never going to succeed as an artist in the community because of this that you see right here. Um, because of my, my uh, cultural background, because of my accent, because of the color of my skin. Um, so, so that just made me, made me feel obviously that I didn't belong and that was a struggle. But I said to myself, okay, I think that every single person has a story and we are like human beings are natural storytellers. So I am a storyteller um, as an actor. I help to tell a story with my, um, with my work. So I said, well, I sure can write. And, you know, I had uh, great friends and, and great people that I admire in my community um, that are playwrights. And I always obviously looked up to them and thought that playwriting was easy. It, it was very like romantic, this idea of, well, at least that's what, 
what was on my brain. But it was like, okay, I'm just gonna, you know, sit in front of a beautiful, I don't know, um, view and smoke a cigarette, a drink an, an espresso and write. And, you know, for some people that works, but not for everyone. Um, so I actually, I, I wrote my first play uh, last year. Um, I wrote it because, again, I wanted to show what I was able to, to do as a writer, but also as a performer. And so I wrote this short play uh, that was produced at the fourth annual short play, um, the St. John's Short Play Festival. Um, and I was really happy and really um, excited to be able to be seen and be heard in my community. Um, I had great feedback. Um, so that inspired me and that, you know, like pushed me to keep writing and keep, I thought I was like, well, that wasn't that hard. It was really hard. It was really, really hard. Um, Megan Greeley, who um, is uh, one of my best friends and uh, he, uh, she directed my piece. Um, she also worked with me as sort of like a dramaturg. Um, and she knows uh, how many times I cried and how many times I told her that she, um, that I was going to give her my story to tell because I was so done and so frustrated. She's an amazing playwright too. Um, anyway, so I started writing a little bit more, finding opportunities um, outside of the province. And I, I was uh, selected to be part of the Eastern Front Theater's RBC Emerging Playwright Unit, uh, led by the amazing, the one and only, Pamela Halsted. Um, so working with Pamela has been absolutely phenomenal. I have learned so many things and I am still learning uh, so many things. Uh, she's the artistic director as well for uh, Playwrights Atlantic Resource Center Park which um, just appointed me as the artistic associate. So I will be working with Pam and still learning a lot from, from her. Um, but I, what I do want to share about my experience working with Pam is that the very first time I, I, I wanted to write a full length play. And when I gave her my first draft, I thought, I was like, okay, I'm gonna give her my first draft, then it's gonna come like a second draft with a couple edits and then the play will be ready to go similarly to what happened with Altar. Um, and then she gave me feedback. And basically, she did not say that, but I was like, okay, I need to throw that draft away. Bye-bye. Um, so that was very informative, especially as an emerging writer, because that like completely broke my idea of what playwriting was. Um, I realized that it was going to be hard and I was like, wow, do I really want to do this? And I said, well, sure. Um, but no, because I, again, like to me, it was very important to be telling and sharing these stories. So I said, okay, if, if I need to learn how to do this, I'll do it. Um, so one of the things, pardon me, one of the things that Pam would always encourage me to do was to write, 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 write. And she would say, this might not end, it, end up in your draft. This might not end up, end up in your play. And I was so frustrated. I couldn't understand it. I was like, so why am I writing? If, it's, if this is not going to make it into the final thing, why am I writing it? Now, obviously, in the, in the time that I have been doing a little bit more writing, I have understood the, the, the value of writing. And so my first, one of the things that I would like to share with you tonight is that you have to write. It's so, um, and I have seen this and I would like to, you know, like say who said this before, but I can't remember. Uh, it was probably like a playwriting meme or something. Um, but no, I'm sure that someone else said it, um, that you can't edit an idea, but you can edit a page. And then that to me was like, okay, okay, okay. So um, what I usually do nowadays is like I puke write. That's that's what I call it. I, o I also uh, cry write, uh, but I'm gonna focus on the puke writing. Um, so this is basically, I just like write whatever comes to mind. Um, there is a technique called the Pomodoro technique. Um, and I actually, <laughs> so bristly, but I created the Santidoro technique. <laughs> this is so lame. Oh, I wish I could edit this out, but anyway. Um, 
So basically what I do is very similar to the Pomodoro technique, but like 20 something minutes, I can't. I'm sorry, my brain cannot focus for that long. So what I do is that I grab my phone and I set up the, um, the alarm and I just usually put like a, um, a stopwatch for four minutes, uh, whatever I'm feeling in the moment. And, and, and I say, you know, like I'm gonna write whatever comes to mind, I'm gonna write, I'm gonna write. So I let the, the, the stopwatch uh, go, run, sorry. And then usually by the moment the alarm goes off, I am actually like now motivated to, to start writing. So that is something that I do. Um, one of the other things that also I have been like um, punishing myself a lot is that sometimes I think, you know, like I, I, I wash my dishes and I'm thinking about my characters. I'm uh, doing whatever, like folding laundry, um, eating, whatever, watching another show. And I'm thinking, so I'm actively thinking. And I used to think that that was not actually writing, but then that also made me understand and respect the value of thinking because, you know, like, it's not that I'm not working on it. If I was just, you know, like disengaged, not interested, that would be different. But actually, I am trying to figure things out in my brain. Now, obviously, you know, just because you say, well, thinking is part of my writing, which is true. Um, I think that in the end, we actually have to do a little bit of dry writing. Um, so yeah, think, think as much as you can, as much as you want. Um, but also I would encourage you to put it on paper. Um, the other thing is like, um, be kind to yourself in terms of like not knowing things. It is okay. It is okay when you just have an idea and you're figuring things out. Um, and I think that the part of like sharing is caring is very important because when you share your work, um, people will be able to see things that you aren't seeing at the moment. Um, also talking about th these things, like having someone to soundboard, soundboard your, your idea. So it is clear. It's not only clear in your brain, but it's actually, you're actually being able to, to translate that into like speech, for instance, and then grab that and put it on paper. It's just like breaking it down from an idea into, into whatever you're sharing uh, with your voice and then putting it down on paper. Um, so those are very little simple things. Uh, I mean, I'm probably not rocking your world and I, I am sorry, uh, but these are the things that I have learned in the, um, in the uh, past couple of months, really, that I have been uh, writing more. Um, so anyway, I think it's about time to bring uh, Juan. So I would like to tell you a little bit more about this story um, and this play that I'm working on. So uh, Juan, Juana Juanita follows the journey of Juan, a young Mexican man that has come to Atlantic Canada to pursue a business degree. He believes he knows who he is, what he wants, and exactly what his goal in life is. And perhaps, you know, one of those goals is to find a woman um, as the love of his life and settle in, buy a house, yada, yada, yada. Um, until he discovers the empowerment of stilettos, wigs, makeup, and lipstick competitions when he actually comes to terms with his queer identity. Um, by becoming a drag queen called Juanita Latina. However, Juan struggles to keep the seeds of his cultural baggage while attempting to fit into his new life and maintaining a relationship with a feminine figure from his past. Um, so this is the play that I am writing and this play came um, to my brain after I was talking to uh, Lois Brown, who is an amazing multidisciplinary artist uh, based in St. John's, Newfoundland, Labrador. And um, she, um, I had the privilege to work with her when I was in theater school, and then we became uh, colleagues and, and we became friends. Um, so one day I was talking to her and I showed her a picture of my mom and then a picture of me doing drag. Now, I have to say, yes, I have done drag in the past, but not really. I did drag when I was in university and I did it 
for an event. They invited me. It's a long story and I'm going to keep it short. But the point is that I had no idea what drag meant. Um, I just kind of like at the time I had I had never seen uh, RuPaul's Drag Race, for instance. Like the, I like the base basic education of drag of the war of the drag world uh, and not basic, but like the mainstream. I didn't know. Uh, so I did drag, but anyway, the point is that I showed Lois how similar I look to my mom. And really, when I first looked at myself in the mirror after uh, my friend Ray um, did my makeup, I was like, holy moly guacamole. I look just like my mom. And you know, like growing up, I have I had heard that all of my life that I looked a lot like my mom. I have her brown curly hair. So we had a lot of things in common. Our personalities are very similar too. But man, when I saw myself with that makeup, I was like, oh. So I don't know. I was talking to, um, to Lois and then she said, well, it would be really interesting to write a play about a drag queen trying to play her mom. And then that to me was like, Pah! I start like dreaming about this um, a lot. So that was like the, the, the catalyst for me to and the inspiration to, to be like, wow, yes, I, I, I could. Um, and one of the things that, that um, I was interested in was uh, into exploring this, the, the feminine and the masculine side of a, of a person, if we're talking about binaries, especially just like considering my upbringing where those were the only two. Um, and how I have been able to navigate my queer identity is by embracing both binaries um, and saying, okay, well, yeah, I identify as a, as a man, but I also uh, appreciate and recognize uh, my feminine sides. And so I try to see that as well. And, and just like this idea of like, well, um, the flu fluidity pretty much. Um, so I wanted to explore that and that idea of like how the, the process of getting comfortable with your feminine side when you identify as a as a um, as a man, and also because uh, duh, I love drag so 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 much. I am obsessed. Um, yeah, people know. Um, anyway, uh, so tonight now finally Santiago, shut up. Tonight, uh, what you will be hearing is work in progress. Don't, if your expectations are really high right now, please lower them down. No, that's not low, that's not low enough. Go a little lower. A little lower? Okay, yeah. I, 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 about the, the ground floor, that's kind of okay. Um, because this is a, a work in progress and I really wanted to share something um, sort of uh, raw because... Um, I, I'm, I'm trying to break the, 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 the idea of the work being so sacred and me holding like this vast knowledge and the privacy. I want to, to be more open about my process and, and about like how I work. Um, so that's why I wanted to share something that, you know, it's still, and, and these, um, these monologues that you will um, hear tonight might or might not make make it into the play and I'm okay. So this is part of my exploration. Um, but but I do have to say that that part of my exploration, it has taught me a lot about the character and the the world that um, he lives in. And yeah, to discover things and his wants and his needs. So anyway, just before I jump into the monologues, I, uh, which will be from the perspective of Juan. So just be uh, in the look for Juana and Juanita. Just, I don't know, I don't know. Um, but, but before I jump into the monologues, I truly want to um, acknowledge and in, in, in gratitude the support from the National Theatre School of Canada and the Arts Apart program for helping and, and providing some uh, support to emerging artists during this very, very odd time. The great, great thing about COVID is that it has allowed us to connect in different ways. So because of this program, I am here with you tonight and I am very, very grateful. I also want to acknowledge the support of the CD of St. John's 
uh, Playwrights Atlantic Resource Center and Eastern Front Theater. Mm, I want to send a, a special shout out to Pamela Halsted, who has been amazing, amazing in, in this process. Um, she's my dramaturg for, for this uh, show. And so she's literally holding my hand while I cry and write. And she's the best. She's the MVP. I obviously want to thank uh, Lois Brown. I want to thank uh, Jose Ann Maldonado. And I want to thank uh, Lucero Najera, my mom. Seferino Guzman, my dad. And Maria Andrea Guzman, my sister. Because um, woo, I am here because of you. And I am grateful, and I I hope I'm making you proud. Eso espero. Aquí estoy. Aquí le estamos dando. Um, and I want to thank you. Thank you for tuning in tonight um, to hear me read these excerpts from Juan, Juana, Juanita by Santiago Guzman, a.k.a. me. So, um, okay, so this is the first monologue. I opened the door to my dorm room and the only thing I could see amongst complete darkness was his face lit by his phone. He had a grin in his face that I had never seen before. Full of a, well, you know. Pressure. The moment he noticed me, his cell phone flew off his hands to the ground and immediately covered himself with a blanket. He had never done that. That covering himself at home when he had the heater on blast simply because he liked being shirtless. So I got the hint. <laughs> I apologized and said that I needed to come get my calculator to get back to study. Uh, I did everything I could to not look at him while I was walking towards my desk just across his bed when he started laughing, giggling, like a little kid that was caught doing something forbidden. Then he burst out laughing. <laughs> Ay, cabrón. ¿Qué no te enseñaron en tu casa a tocar la puerta antes de entrar? He was high. I turned the lights on. He gathered himself and then he stood up and uh, I couldn't see anything. I mean, he was still shirtless, but he didn't, you know, he wasn't, yeah, like he was, he was calm down there. And I was surprised because I really thought that I would say, it doesn't matter. So he picked up his phone from the floor and I asked him what he was doing and he didn't say a thing. He looked at me and smiled. After an awkward silence, he said, a las drags, and showed me his phone. It was RuPaul's Drag Race. Season eight. He jumped back on his bed and put his headphones on and pressed play as though I was not standing in the middle of our dorm room staring at him. This stereotypical masculine built charismatic, almost jock like, but nice, smart Latino guy wasn't too. Drag queens? I couldn't believe it. Was my roommate gay? Why didn't he ever say that? Like, we lived together. Literally, the first thing that I would see in the mornings was Martin on the other side of the room, sleeping. He could have... Well, I don't know. I don't know. I never imagined that he... 
Anyway, I turned the lights off and left the room. And as I was walking back to the common room where I was studying, I realized I had actually left my room without the damn calculator. I was just not expecting to find Martin. I hesitated for a moment, uh, unsure if it was a good idea to go back to my room, but I did anyway. This time, I made sure to knock before entering because I didn't want to repeat what just had happened. Pásale, cabrón. So I did and apologized for coming back, but explained that I had forgotten my calculator. And then he looked at me with his phone in his hands and said, ¿Quieres ver? A las drags. Yes, I was curious to watch, but I wasn't sure if... Well, uh, I had to go back and finish studying. I had a quiz the next day, so... Te va a gustar. How did he know that I was going to like it? So I jumped on his bed and found my calculator lying next to him. I looked at him, que? Without taking my eyes off of him, I took one of his headphones from his hands, put it on my ear, and he said, Te va a gustar. Lights. So that's the first monologue. Um, these are not in any specific order, or are they? I don't know. Um, so this is monologue numero dos. This is still one. I never actually... I'm just silly. That's why my mom would have... Never mind. I did it for a laugh, really. It was Halloween and Emily really wanted to go to a silly costume party, but I didn't have one. Like, a costume. I actually had never put a lot of effort into dressing up for Halloween, even when I was back in Mexico. <laughs> yes, we do celebrate Halloween. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't call it celebrate, but uh, what's the word? Uh, anyway, I was never one of those kids, you know? I was a throw a mask on and that's it kind of a kid. But Emily was really, really, really into Halloween. I mean, I think she was into every single holiday. Easter, St. Patty's, even Queen Victoria Day. Yep, I'm serious. That's my... my M. Emily said to me that she had never gone to a Halloween party with a boyfriend, so she wanted us to wear matching costumes. Yeah, she had donned group costuming. Is that even a word? Well, I, I don't know, but she never had a boyfriend, boyfriend to go with. My guess is that guys had broken up with her just before making any Thanksgiving commitments. Stakes are high around that time, you know, like family and shit. So Emily came up with the brilliant and hilarious idea of dressing up as her. Yeah, you heard that right. Both of us dressing up as her. But here's the thing. I would have to dress up as her. Like the living, walking Emily we both knew. And she would dress up as her own ghost. Yep, I'm serious. What I couldn't understand was how it would be spooky for me to dress up as a what. At the time, I wasn't sure I was in for the game. The idea of putting on a dress just made me feel odd. I suggested dressing up as a Mexican and a Newfoundlander and Labradorian, and she asked me if I had an extra sombrero she could borrow. 
I said to her that I meant that we were already a Mexican and a Newfoundlander and Labradorian. She said it would be cheating since we wouldn't be dressing up and that would be no fun. She had a point, I suppose. So I thought to myself, why not? It's just a dress. It's just one night. It's just a game. So I said yes. And immediately, Emily took me to her room and opened her closet. She couldn't even look at her clothes with all the laughter as she was picturing me wearing her stuff. And, and that smile, her smile, that's all I care for. I was happy that I was making her happy, even if that meant walking on her heels and probably fracturing only one ankle, if I was lucky. Emily ended up picking a tight black dress with a deep, long opening on his chest. I said to her that it wasn't fair because I had never seen her wear something like that before, and she said that she was saving it for a special occasion. <laughs> I guess all of that meant way more to her than it did to me. She grabbed me from the collar and sat me in front of her vanity. She looked at the mirror while still making eye contact and said that I would never be the same ever again. She threw makeup on my face as though it was a clear canvas ready to become a masterpiece. At times, she would press my face with brushes too firmly that I couldn't help but to moan a little. Like, I was in pain, but I was still kind of enjoying it. When she was done, she threw a wig on my head. Honestly, I had no idea where she got that from, but I just went with it. No questions, I just went with whatever she put on me. She asked me if I was ready, and at that point, I was definitely hyped up because she kept looking at me, screaming, laughing, going wild with whatever she was doing to my face, so I said, yes. She turned my chair around so I could see myself reflect her on the mirror, and... Well, it was not what I expected. I can't even think about it. I looked just like her. No, not Emily. Juana. Emily was afraid I hated it, so I said it was fine. I tried to keep it cool to show Em I was the most confident Emily there ever was. Whew. Well, who knew that that night, my girlfriend became my mother. Well, my drag mother. Lights. Hey, monologue number three. So this, uh, this is a sort of like a monologue slash a scene. So I'm gonna. I'm gonna have a um, couple of stage directions. Uh, hopefully it's clear. So this is monologue slash scene number three. Juan rushes into a washroom at a college party. He locks the door and walks backwards until he finds his reflection of his face in the mirror. He opens the tap and washes his face once. What the actual fuck? He, was, he washes his face twice and looks at himself in the mirror and sees Juana. No, 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 <laughs> no, 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 it, it didn't happen. He washes his face thrice, looks at his reflection in the mirror. It didn't happen, did it? Holy shit. What the fuck is wrong with you, Juan? Where did that even... I can't believe it. 
he paces around the small bathroom and then he finds his face in the reflection in the mirror and stares at it for a moment. Okay, this is not a dream. Ah, you idiot. Uh, coming, I, uh, uh, I'm not feeling well. Yeah, I'm just gonna say I was a little drunk. That's it. I'm gonna say I didn't know what happened. If they ask me about it tomorrow, I'll just, I'll just say I can't remember. Uh, yes, I'll pretend to be shocked, deny it, deny everything at all costs, and tell them how much I love my girlfriend. Oh yeah, sure, they'll fucking buy that. <sighs> Holy shit. Okay, okay. Um, I, I would... I, I would... Oh, um, when I see him again, I'll simply say... No homo, bro. Yeah, that's, that's what I'll say. Uh, I'll, I'll just say that I was loaded and that I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, yeah, that that the way he held he held uh, um, he held me while I was that, while we were dancing. Well, yeah, my ass rubbing on his crotch, holding hands tightly, kissing his juicy juicy lips. Damn, I can still feel his tongue inside my mouth. Juan, what the hell were you thinking? Well, that's the thing. You were not fucking thinking. Okay. Breathe. There's nothing I can do now. Really. Well, there are two options here. One, pretend it didn't happen and excuse myself for being so drunk. Or two, own my actions and behavior, talk to him and... Now, nah, I'll just blame it on the alcohol. Juan? Are you... Are you gay? Holy shit. What am I gonna tell Emily? I'm sure someone will go tell her that her boyfriend was dancing closely with his roommate and ended up kissing him passionately in the middle of the party. What was I thinking, goddammit? In the middle of the fucking party? Are you fucking kidding me? I... What do I do now? Um, I could transfer to another university. I could just simply move to Cornerbrook and finish my degree out here, out there. Okay, yeah, but like, how much do you hate, your, you hate yourself, Juan? <laughs> nope. Bad idea. I'm sure Emily has cousins or something on the other side of the province anyway. I'll probably tell her. Juan... There's no place to hide. He turns the lights off, then turns the back on. He turns the lights off, then turns them back on. And he keeps doing that in a loop until he creates his own nightclub inside the washroom. He leaves the lights off and keeps dancing to the audible beat behind the washroom room. <laughs> I was laughing <laughs> like an idiot. Yes, I'll blame it on the alcohol, sure, but man, I felt free for the first time. Oh, I had longed to dance with Martin like that since we started hugging each other to say goodnight. I wanted to feel his arms wrapped around me while I was letting my hips loose and rubbing my body against him. 
Oh, I wanted to pass my hands all over his hair, touch the rough texture of his almost faded beard with my hands, and allow my fingers to touch his lips and slip a finger inside his mouth. He turns the lights on, and he looks at himself in the mirror. No, Juan. No. You're motherfucking straight. You like boobs? You like pussy. You want a wife to raise your kids with and a buy a big, big, big ass house. You, you want your mom to be proud of you. He washes his face one last time. He takes a deep breath. Okay, here we go. He leaves the washroom and leaves the lights on. They go off and they turn back on and then off again until it becomes Juan's little empty washroom party. End of monologue. And that's it. Oh my goodness gracious. Well, that was a journey. Um, yeah, that was it. Jeez. Okay, that happened. Um, thank you very much. I'm seeing um, my mom. Gracias, mami. Gracias. Te amo. Gracias por ver esto. Um, and my friend Caroline. Felicia, muchas gracias. Um, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, once again, thank you for you um, watching tonight. Uh, thank you um, to the National Theater School of Canada. Uh, thank you, friend Jeremy. Oh my God. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you, Park. Thank you, Pam. Thank you, everyone. Um, this was really. Um, it was something. It was a great experience, and I really appreciate you uh, watching in tonight. Um, and before I leave, I uh, once again I want to uh, encourage you to make a donation to First Light and um, their arts program. Um, my name is Santiago Guzman, and um, yeah, hopefully I'll get to see you soon. Bye bye. Gracias, mami. Te amo. <laughs>